Hello, my name is Roger Berkowitz, and I'm the founder and academic director of the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Welcome to uh, the discussion of On Revolution. This is the lecture related to the book On Revolution by Hannah Arendt, which we're reading today in the virtual reading group. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the chapter on the social question. This is perhaps one of the most controversial chapters Hannah Arendt wrote. Uh, after her essay on Little Rock, uh, maybe her most infamous chapter. It's widely criticized, um, I think less widely understood. Uh, so today I'm going to try and help us understand that it's a long and, and fairly involved chapter. And so let me give you a quick run through of the overview of the argument, which isn't gonna cover everything. There's a lot of asides in this chapter. So the argument goes like this, poverty, is different from misery. Mass poverty is a kind of misery in which we're not just poor, we're miserable and at the mercy of our needs and our bodily necessity. This misery is politicized at some point, most theoretically by uh, Karl Marx, but also in the French Revolution. And as it is, it's no longer seen as as a natural part of life. Poverty has always been there, but now misery is seen as something that can be overcome and gotten rid of. Uh, the problem then is that the rulers uh, of the French Revolution and most rulers of most states um, are from the wealthier classes and thus their legitimacy um, is found in compassion, in compassion with the poor. And so they have to sort of show themselves to be compassionate and talk about ending poverty. This compassion though, which is a real uh, emotion when one confronts a single individual in pain or suffering, um, is perverted when it's converted into pity, which is felt for masses of people, um, the poor in general, as opposed to a particular person. And this pity is cruel insofar as pity allows us to um, cut off uh, a patient's leg uh, in order to save their life. Uh, in order to save the lives of the poor, uh, we can uh, basically uh, treat them with utter disdain um, and uh, subject them to our rule. Um, nobody, she says, is good in their heart, uh, and thus this claim for pity always is a kind of hypocrisy. Um, and this hypocrisy uh, is part of politics, and yet with the rise of this claim of compassion and goodness into politics that comes from the French Revolution and the need for the wealthy rulers to find their legitimacy in their goodness, um, we run into this claim of unmasking the hypocrites, exposing the natural person behind them, and claiming them to be good or bad, but since nobody's good, we end up um, with naked need and interest and a kind of corruption that can lead to terror. Um, she says on page 102 at the very end of the chapter, quote, although the whole record of past revolutions demonstrates beyond doubt that every attempt to solve the social question with political means leads into terror and that it is terror which sends revolutions to their doom, it can hardly be, not, did not be denied that to avoid this fatal mistake is almost impossible when a revolution breaks out under conditions of mass poverty. So pity leads to compassion, I mean, sorry, uh, poverty leads to compassion, leads to, is perverted into pity. Pity brings hypocrisy. Hypocrisy leads to the seeking to eliminate uh, all persons who aren't purely good, which is terror. And sadly, um, this is what happens to revolutions under conditions of mass poverty. The one exception <laughs> uh, which Arendt finds is the American Revolution, um, which she uh, says was uh, blessed by a kind of ignorance um, and an ignorance, ignorance of um, misery in its midst, namely slavery. Uh, and as a result, 
it was not a revolution driven by compassion and pity, but by solidarity. And then she thus offers solidarity as an alternative to pity, as a way of uniting um, the different classes of society in a revolution based on freedom. And so there's only one page on solidarity in the text. Uh, it's widely ignored. I, I think it's probably one of the most important of Arendt's ideas that is almost completely ignored by most Arendt scholars. So we'll, we'll talk about that in section um, four of, of, of the text. So that's the, the structure of it. Uh, I, I, it's long and complicated, as I said, and I'm going to try and do my best to walk you through it. Section one is on this question of uh, poverty and mass poverty. And she writes on page 50, poverty is more than deprivation. It is a state of constant want and acute misery whose ignominy consists in its dehumanizing force. Poverty is abject because it puts men under the absolute dictates of their bodies, that is, under the absolute dictate of necessity. So the key here is we distinguish poverty from misery, um, and misery is really what is the problem. You can have poor people who aren't miserable, who aren't abject, um, who aren't under the dictate of necessity. And she says on page 52 and 53 that it was really Karl Marx who um, made poverty a political force, misery a political force, uh, insofar as he made the crucial claim that poverty is the result of exploitation. It's not natural. Whereas for Arendt, um, poverty had been a natural phenomena for centuries, if not longer. Um, Marx transformed the social question into a political force um, by employing the word exploitation and arguing that the um, ruling class's power is a result of exploitation. Um, the second, uh, and, and so this set in motion the idea of the social revolution as one that would undo the political uh, fruits of exploitation and make everybody equal. Um, the second chapter um, is, is, the second section of this chapter is about the American Revolution and it's sort of the, the road not taken for most modern revolutions and it suggests that American Revolution succeeded in avoiding uh, terror and the question of uh, the social question because poverty was absent from the American scene but present everywhere else in the world. This is a quote on page 58. Um, what does it mean to say that poverty was absent from the American scene? Uh, on the one hand, there were poor people in America, but what Arendt says is that what everyone who came to America and talked about America said is that even though they were poor people, they were, um, they were part of the American political world in a way that the poor in Europe were not. They weren't miserable. They had land, or they at least could go and participate in town meetings. They had a voice, and they could also, if they were really poor, they could move out west and then have land, and um, there was not the kind of misery that there had been in the um, cities of Europe. Uh, the result is that the poor were not invisible. And, and this, she has this great little dissertation here on how misery is not actually a product of money so much as it is a product of um, invisibility. Now, they're related insofar as if you're abjectly poor, you have become a slave to the needs of your body, you are invisible publicly because all you can do is find your food and shelter. But um, it's this idea of misery and darkness um, that is the curse of poverty. Um, the one great exception here is slavery. And so she will write on page 60, the absence of the social question in America, quote, must strike us as very strange indeed when we remind, our, when we remind ourselves that the absence of the social question from the American scene was, after all, quite deceptive and that abject and degrading misery was present everywhere in the form of slavery and Negro labor. And so uh, she says this is clearly 
based on overlooking of slavery. Um, and this is a problem because what do we say about this American Revolution, which succeeded in a way because it uh, overlooked misery and therefore overlooked the misery of slavery. And she says on 61, we are tempted to ask ourselves if the goodness of the poor white man's country did not depend to a considerable degree upon black labor and black misery. And then um, she says, there were more miserable black slaves in America than miserable poor people in Europe. And so she thinks in many ways, it is the case that the success and goodness of the white man's country did depend upon black labor and black misery. And she concludes, quote, from this, we can only conclude that the institution of slavery carries an obscurity even blacker than the obscurity of poverty. The slave, not the poor man, was wholly overlooked. And, and this is, for Arendt, um, the real problem of the American Revolution. She calls slavery the primordial sin. She says the founders were not moved by pity, and that was because they ignored slavery. Um, and it wasn't just them, she says it wasn't a moral, she says it wasn't just American founders. All the European visitors who came, she says, ignored slavery and talked about how America was a land without poverty and misery. Um, and so uh, for Arendt, this will come back. This absence of slavery, overlooking of it, is perhaps the um, primordial sin that will undo the success of the American Republic. Um, in part three, she returns to the, the main story. So uh, part, part two of this chapter on America was really the, the road not taken. And now in part three, we come back to this uh, story that she's telling of the politicization of mass poverty and now the rise of compassion and therefore pity as the um, center of the social question modern revolutions. So in the French Revolution, she says, the revolutionaries were the upper class, not the poor. And thus solidarity with the poor required a kind of special effort of virtue, which Rousseau and then Robespierre called the passion of compassion. Um, Arendt writes, quote, on 65, this virtue was not Roman. It did not aim at the res publica, and had nothing to do with freedom. Virtue meant to have the welfare of the people in mind, to identify one's own will with the will of the people. And this effort was directly directed primarily toward the happiness of the many. The personal legitimacy of those who represented the people could reside only in the capacity to suffer with the immense class of the poor, accompanied by the will to raise compassion to the rank of the supreme political passion and the highest political virtue. So the, t the shift from the res publica, a concern of the leaders with the public world, with the institutions and the polis as a whole, to a compassionate politics in which the concern is to prove one's legitimacy and goodness by one's compassion for the poor. Um, leads to this idea that there is a single voice, a single uh, interest in society, which is the interest of the people, the, the, the poor. Um, and that this is a kind of solidarity through a, a, a oneness, a pity with um, the one voice of society. And so she writes... To Robespierre, it was obvious, this is on page 71, it was obvious that the one force which could and must unite the different classes of society into one nation was the compassion of those who did not suffer with those who were Malou, of the highest classes with the low people. The magic of compassion was that it opened the heart of the sufferer to the sufferings of others whereby it established and confirmed the natural bond between man, which only the rich had lost. So compassion is a magical passion that re-bonds the rich who had lost this bond 
um, with the poor. And so the great effort, uh, she says, is the selfish, selfless capacity to lose oneself in the suffering of others uh, rather than active goodness. And this then becomes perverted from compassion, which can be, again, a real uh, emotional connection with those who are suffering, to pity, um, the solidarity with the, of the rich, not with individuals who are suffering, but with this abstraction called the poor. And she she talks about um, this both within the context of Herman Melville and um, Dostoevsky. Uh, the, I think the easiest way to understand it is through her description of the Grand Inquisitor in the Brothers Karamazov. The point is that Ju Jesus has compassion, but his compassion is mute. It can't say anything. It must simply suffer when confronted with the suffering of a person. Whereas the Grand Inquisitor pities the lump, and he tries to pity the whole people, he depersonalizes the sufferers, and thus um, we feel how false and idealistic his pity is, and he can then... Um, deprive them of their freedom in order to give them bread and, in a sense, use them to keep his own rule in, in, in force. And this is the kind of perversion that pity is. Um, she writes on, on page 76 to 7, because combat compassion abolishes the distance, the worldly space between men where political matters the whole realm of human affairs are located. Now, this is compassion as pity here. Passion and pity abolish this distance. It remains, politically speaking, irrelevant and without consequence, incapable of establishing lasting institution. As a rule, it is not compassion which sets out to change the worldly conditions in order to ease human suffering. But if it does, it will shun the drawn-out, wearisome processes of persuasion, negotiation, and compromise, which are the processes of law and politics, and lend its voice to the suffering itself, which must claim for swift and direct action, that is, for action with the means of violence. The point here is that when compassion and pity become politicized and seek to change the world, they're not going to barter and negotiate and persuade and compromise. They're going to uh, use violence. And this is uh, what can lead to terror in the name of goodness. Um, to me, the key of the chapter is on page 79. Uh, again, this is where she discusses the alternative to pity, which she calls solidarity. It's widely ignored by most uh, readers of RN. It's only a page, but I think it's worth pulling it out here. So first, she says uh, on page um, uh, 78 and 79, that and 80, she describes pity. On the one hand, pity is distant, whereas compassion is near. Pity is at the many, whereas compassion is for the one. Pity is limited to the poor and weak. But here, pity needs the weak. It has an interest in the poor. Those who are in power because they show their pity and compassion need the poor to show their pity and compassion. Um, and thus, you never see pity end. So every time a new right is won, and every time welfare is achieved, workplace regulation is achieved, there's a new inequality, a new pity to be um, uh, shown. And thus, you constantly... Uh, have people you can pity and thus have, a, have a, a defense and a justification for your own power and rule. Um, she says, pity is more cruel than cruelty itself. And she describes this on page 79 to 80. Pity taken as the spring of virtue has proved to possess a greater capacity for cruelty than cruelty itself. Thus the clever and helpful surgeon with his cruel and benevolent knife cuts off the gangrene limb in order to save the body of the sick man. Um, in the name of pity, we can do all sorts of evil uh, and justify it. Um, the alternative, as I said, is solidarity. And so on 78 to 79, she writes, pity may be the perversion of compassion, 
but its alternative is solidarity. It is out of pity that men are attracted to their own fable, but it is out of solidarity that they establish deliberately and, as it were, dispassionately a community of interest with the oppressed and exploited. So it is out of solidarity that we don't act passionately with feeling to show and prove ourselves to have a kind of um, uh, compassion for these poor, but it is a kind of a community of interest with the oppressed and exploited. We show that we are all the same. We actually have, it's not that we admit the interest of the poor, we articulate an interest that encompasses the poor and the powerful, the poor and the rich. And she continues, the common interest would then be the grandeur of man or the honor of the human race or the dignity of man for solidarity because it partakes of reason and hence of generality is able to comprehend a multitude conceptually, not only the multitude of a class or a nation or a people, but eventually all mankind. And this is really her argument that instead of a compassion for the poor, which is always a kind of hypocritical um, uh, claim, and then we seek to hunt out hypocrites and expose them, what we have to do is articulate a grand human interest, which encompasses the public, the entirety of the people. She continues, but this solidarity, though it may be aroused by suffering, is not guided by it. It can be aroused by suffering, but the point is not to be simply guided by ending suffering. And she continues, and it comprehends this new solidarity, the strong and the rich, no less than the weak and the poor. Compared to the sentiment of pity, it may appear cold and abstract, for it remains committed to ideas, to greatness or honor or dignity, rather than to any love of men. And this, this idea of, of solidarity, I think, is very foreign to many of us. Um, and it may be something that people really find silly or idealistic in Arendt. Um, and I think she realizes that, uh, which is why she says that it's almost impossible in a condition of um, poverty and mat misery for a, a revolution to be... Um, governed by solidarity. That's the quote I read at the beginning from page 100. But she says there was a revolution that was governed by solidarity and not pity, and that was the American Revolution. Um, and yet it could only be governed by solidarity and not pity because of an enormous ignorance and overlooking of misery in its midst, a kind of in, in slavery. And so we're left with this somewhat um, paradoxical, I think, uh, and difficult claim that Arendt is making, which is that uh, all revolutions will succumb to pity and become social revolutions and trade freedom for a kind of pitiful uh, social solidarity, which will lead to hypocrisy and terror. The one example of one that didn't, the American Revolution, uh, could only do so because it was lucky enough to um, overlook the miserable in its midst. Um, it's an extraordinary claim, and I think we then have to ask, what, what does she mean? Where, where, does, where does she end up? Do we want to overlook misery in our midst? Or do we want to recognize it? Or, and here's maybe, I think, the hope, seeing the danger of being driven by misery and also the evil of overlooking misery, we can somehow confront misery without being um, consumed with politically overcoming it in such a way that we sacrifice solidarity and engage in a politics of pity. And that seems to be one of 
hopes that RN here offers in this chapter. Uh, the last two sections are on hypocrisy, and they're fantastic. I think I've already uh, spoke enough about them um, for you to read them on your own, and we can talk about them in our discussion. I very much look forward to discussing Han Arendt's social question with you. Enjoy reading Han Arendt.